There are several men in prison who have been termed as most feared man in US prison. You may be surprised to know that 10 out of the 25 most feared prisoners in America are currently housed in federal correctional facilities. These individuals have earned their reputations through their crimes and actions. From notorious gang leaders to ruthless killers, each one has a chilling story to tell. And today, we will take a look at some of the reasons why these prisoners are so feared. Richard Lee McNair. Meet Richard Lee McNair, a man with a knack for giving authorities a run for their money. But don't let his ability to dodge the long arm of the law fool you. He's not your average criminal. McNair's story isn't just about murder, attempted murder, and burglary, though he did earn himself two life sentences for those crimes. No, what really makes McNair one heck of a criminal and earns him a ticket to the notorious ADX Supermax prison is his Houdini-like talent for escaping from the clutches of confinement. Born on December 19, 1958, McNair quickly made a name for himself as a convicted murderer. Murderer. In 1987, he found himself tangled in a botched robbery that resulted in the death of one man and left another with four gunshot wounds. That gruesome ordeal landed him behind bars, where most criminals would have just accepted their fate, but not McNair. You see, McNair wasn't content with life on the inside. He had a burning desire for freedom that knew no bounds, and so began his remarkable career of breaking free from captivity. Not once, not twice, but three times. Each escape was a huge display of audacity. His first escape was like a scene out of a movie. Armed with nothing but lip balm and the guts, McNair managed to slip out of a pair of handcuffs. But McNair wasn't going to stop at one great escape. He soon found himself crawling through a ventilation duct, evading capture once again. It was as though he had a secret map of the prison hidden in his mind. Then came the piece de resistance of his escape career. In April 2006, McNair pulled off the ultimate disappearing act. He concealed himself within a pile of used postal mailbags and, in a stroke of genius, convinced a police officer that he was just a harmless jogger. Can you just imagine? This daring escape spree earned McNair a spot on America's Most Wanted, making him one of the most sought-after fugitives in the country. He even ventured all the way to Canada twice in a desperate bid to stay off the grid. For over a year, he crisscrossed the Great White North, managing to stay one step ahead of the authorities. What's truly fascinating is that much of what we know about McNair's incredible escapes and his life on the lam comes from his prison correspondence with a Canadian journalist named Byron Christopher. It's like something out of a thrilling detective novel, with each letter revealing more about the man behind the escapes. So, while McNair's initial crimes may have landed him behind bars, it's his uncanny ability to defy confinement that secured his place in the legendary ADX Supermax prison. This goes to show that real-life criminals can be just as captivating as the characters we see on the big screen. Dennis Rader let me introduce you to a man who goes by the name Dennis Lynn Raider, but you might know him better as BTK, which stands for Bind, Torture, Kill. Now, this guy was born in Pittsburgh, Kansas, on March 9th, 1945. His parents were Dorothea May Raider, a bookkeeper, who passed away on October 14th, 2007, and William Elvin Raider, who worked for the Kansas Gas Service, but had long passed away on December 27th, 1996. Dennis was the eldest of four sons in the Raider family, and they all grew up in Wichita. But here's where things take a huge turn. Dennis didn't have the most nurturing childhood. His parents were always busy with work, so he and his brothers didn't get much attention at home. Dennis felt particularly ignored by his mother, and well, he held a grudge against her for that. Now, as a young lad, Dennis had some seriously disturbing thoughts. He had these twisted fantasies about hurting women who were trapped and helpless, and if that's not bad enough, he had a real messed up side to him. You know, zoo sadism. This guy would torture, kill, and even hang small animals. I mean, seriously, who does that? But that's not even the worst of it. Between 1970 and 1991, Raider terrorized Wichita and Park City, Kansas. He's responsible for at least 10 gruesome murders, and he didn't discriminate much, though his favorite targets were women. He'd tie them up, sometimes using things he found in their own homes, and then he'd either suffocate them with a plastic bag or strangle them with a ligature. This dude was also into collecting mementos from his victims, like their underwear, eye discs, and personal stuff. And here's the crazy part. He'd send these creepy letters to the cops and the media, bragging about his sickening deeds. The guy had a sick sense of satisfaction from tormenting everyone. Now, after a 13-year break from his twisted activities, he started sending those taunting letters again in 2004. But guess what? That's what led to his downfall. In 2005, they finally nabbed him while he was cruising near his home in Park City. An officer asked him if he knew why he was headed downtown, and he replied with something like, oh, I have suspicions why. After that, they searched his house, car, and even the places he frequented, like the church he attended and his office at City Hall. They found all kinds of evidence, including computer stuff, a pair of black panties, 
Beehost stashed in a shed and a mysterious cylindrical container. And that, my friends, is how they put an end to BTK's reign of terror. Today, Dennis Lynn Raider is living out his days in the El Dorado Correctional Facility, where he's serving 10 consecutive life sentences. Jason Barnum. It's 2012, and all eyes, quite literally, are on an American criminal named Jason Barnum. This guy, who was 37 at the time, strolls into a courtroom, and what's the first thing you notice? Well, his right eye isn't quite what you'd expect. It's not a regular eye. It's a canvas for a tattoo. Yep, you heard that right. The white of his eye was inked up. It's no wonder they gave him the nickname Eyeball. Now, let's rewind a bit. Jason Barnum had been quite the troublemaker for most of his life. Trouble had a habit of finding him, but this time, he found himself in a world of it. Why, you ask? Well, it all went down in Anchorage, Alaska. He was holed up in a hotel room, minding his own business or maybe not, when the police crashed his party. Naturally, things escalated pretty fast. Barnum, not one to back down, decided to use his gun. Shots rang out, and when the smoke cleared, a police officer was unfortunately wounded, and Barnum had a fresh bullet hole in his right arm. Ouch, right? But that wasn't the end of it. Our man was swiftly handcuffed, hustled out of the hotel room, and placed on a stretcher for a not-so-pleasant trip to the hospital. Well, you can't just shoot a cop and expect a spa day, can you? Fast forward to 2015, and the hammer of justice came down on Jason. He was convicted and officially slapped with a 22-year sentence. Deputy District Attorney Clint Campion laid it all out. Barnum had pleaded guilty to attempted murder, mixed in a little first-degree burglary, and sprinkled some third-degree weapons misconduct on top for good measure. Now, here's where the story goes downhill, something that even Hollywood couldn't script. Rumors started swirling around the globe, creating more buzz than a beehive at a summer picnic. Some folks claimed that Barnum's dad was none other than a beloved American actor. Can you imagine that? From a tattooed eyeball to Hollywood royalty in one sentence. But here's the scoop, straight from the rumor-busting department. Nope, his dad wasn't a famous actor. Sometimes, the internet just cooks up these crazy stories, and folks gobble them up like popcorn at the movies. The truth is, when it comes to the precise location of a guy like Jason Barnum, the authorities tend to play their cards close to the chest. However, his alleged Facebook profile says he's been serving his sentence at Spring Creek Correctional Center in Seward, Alaska. So, until there's some concrete, official word on where he's doing his time, let's just file this under Internet Mysteries and move on with our day. After all, we've got plenty of other wild stories to explore, right? Joseph James D'Angelo Born on November 8, 1945, this guy wore many hats. And I don't mean that figuratively. He was a real-life chameleon, a serial killer, rapist, burglar, former police officer, and even a mechanic. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. There's quite a tale to tell. Between 1974 and 1986, D'Angelo went on a horrifying spree across California. He racked up a chilling record. At least 13 murders, 51 rapes, and a staggering 120 burglaries. It's the kind of stuff that nightmares are made of. He didn't just terrorize one place. He had three separate crime sprees that kept California on edge. The press couldn't keep up with his changing locales, so they gave him different nicknames for each one. In the San Joaquin Valley, he was known as the Vizalia Ransacker. Then he moved to Sacramento, where he became the East Area Rapist. But he didn't stop there. His modus operandi led to more attacks in Stockton, Modesto, and Contra Costa County. But wait, there's more. D'Angelo wasn't done yet. He spread his reign of terror to Santa Barbara, Ventura, and Orange Counties, earning himself the moniker Night Stalker. Later, to avoid confusion with another serial killer named Richard Ramirez, who was also called Night Stalker. They had to come up with Original Night. Stalker for D'Angelo. This guy wasn't just about committing heinous acts. He was all about taunting and threatening. He'd make obscene phone calls and maybe even send creepy letters to both his victims and the police. This guy's audacity knew no bounds. The authorities carried out a decades-long investigation, with several suspects cleared through DNA evidence, alibis, and good old-fashioned detective work. In 2001, they finally connected the dots and realized that the East Area Rapist and the Original Night Night Stalker were one and the same. That's when the term Eurons was coined. But it was crime writer Michelle McNamara who really got the world's attention when she called him the Golden State Killer in 2013. It was like something out of a crime novel. Then, in 2016, the FBI and local law enforcement went all out, offering a $50,000 reward to capture the Golden State Killer. The breakthrough finally came in 2018 when DNA evidence led to D'Angelo's arrest, and they used forensic genetic genealogy to identify members of his family. Here's the catch. Because of California's statute of limitations, they couldn't charge him for the 1970s rapes, but they got him on eight counts of first-degree murder, thanks to that DNA evidence. In June 2020, D'Angelo admitted to his gruesome crimes as part of a plea bargain, sparing himself the death penalty. He also confessed to other crimes, including those rapes from way back when. The guy's life imprisonment without parole was sealed on August 21, 2020. John Wayne Gacy 
John Wayne. Gacy seemed like an ordinary dude, but he had a sinister side that would give anyone the creeps. You see, Gacy wasn't just a regular Joe. He was an American serial killer and sex offender, a real-life nightmare. He left a trail of terror in Norwood Park Township, near Chicago, where he did unspeakable things to at least 33 young men and boys. But what's even more spine-tingling is how he got his creepy nickname, the Killer Clown. Before his monstrous crimes were uncovered, Gacy had a side gig that would make your skin crawl. He used to perform as a clown in public. Imagine that, a killer hiding behind a clown's mask. Now, let's really get into the grim details of his horrific deeds. Gacy did all his dirty work in his ranch-style house, but he didn't just randomly grab his victims off the street. No, he had a creepier method. He'd invite them over, pretending to show them a magic trick. Innocent enough, right? But then, he'd put handcuffs on them, and the nightmare would begin. He'd do the unimaginable, rape, torture, and torment his helpless captives. And then, he'd snuff out their lives in the most terrifying ways, like asphyxiation or strangulation with a garret. It's scary to think about it, I tell you. But where it gets even more horrifying is that Gacy had a gruesome habit of burying his victims right under his house in the crawl space. Can you believe it? 26 innocent lives are hidden beneath the floorboards, trapped forever. And he didn't stop there. Three more poor souls were buried elsewhere on his property, and four were thrown into the dark waters of the Deplaned River. But Gacy had a dark past too. He had been convicted back in 1968 for the sodomy of a teenage boy in Waterloo, Iowa. Shockingly, he was sentenced to just 10 years, but ended up serving a mere 18 months. It's enough to make your blood boil. He claimed his first victim in 1972, and by the end of 1975, he'd already taken two more lives. The horrors escalated after his divorce from his second wife in 1976. It's as if the end of his marriage unleashed an even darker side of him. But justice soon caught up with him, and in 1978, a teenager named Robert Peast from Des Plaines went missing. That's when the investigation led straight to Gacy's door. On December 21st, 1978, he was arrested, and the world breathed a sigh of relief. Gacy's conviction for a staggering 33 murders all by one individual set a grim record in United States legal history. He was sentenced to death on March 13th, 1980, and the world waited for the day when he would face the ultimate punishment. Finally, on May 10th, 1994, justice was served as he was executed by lethal injection at Stateville Correctional Center. Ted John Kaczynski Born on May 22, 1942, in the peaceful world of mathematics, Theodore John Kaczynski had a promising future ahead of him, but life had other plans. He was a math whiz, a real prodigy, but in 1969, he did something unexpected. He ditched his academic career. Instead of chasing formulas and theorems, he opted for something completely different, a primitive lifestyle. Now, that's a curveball if I ever saw one. Fast forward to the late 1970s and mid-1990s, and you'll find John in a whole new light. He wasn't just a mathematician, he had become a domestic terrorist. During those years, he committed unthinkable acts. He killed three people and injured 23 others in a nationwide spree of mail bombings. His targets? People he believed were pushing forward modern technology and destroying Mother Nature. John penned a mammoth 35,000-word manifesto titled Industrial Society and Its Future. It was more than just a rant. It was a full-blown social critique. In it, he slammed industrialization, gave the boot to leftism, and championed a kind of anarchism that was all about getting back to nature. Now, in 1971, John pulled a dis disappearing act. He moved to a remote cabin out in the wilds of Lincoln, Montana. But then, something happened. He watched as the wilderness around his cabin was devoured by industrialization, and that's when he snapped. He decided he had to do something about it. That something turned out to be terrorism, and thus, the Unabomber was born. The FBI couldn't catch a break with this guy. From 1979 until his arrest in 1996, they were on his tail, trying to hunt him down. They called the case Unabom, short for University and Airline Bomber, before they even knew who he was. The media just picked up on it and dubbed him the Unabomber. In 1995, John sent a letter to the New York Times, making a chilling promise. He said he'd stop the terror if they published his manifesto. He argued that his bombings were extreme, but necessary to draw attention to the erosion of human freedom and dignity by modern technologies. The FBI and the U.S. Attorney General got involved, pushing for the essay's publication, which eventually happened. Now here's the twist in the tale. John's own brother, David, read the manifesto and had a gut feeling. He recognized the writing style and reported his suspicions to the FBI. That's when the net began to tighten around the Unabomber. In 1996, they finally nabbed him, and John, still maintaining his sanity, went to court. He tried to get rid of his court-appointed lawyers because they wanted him to plead insanity to dodge the death penalty. In the end, he pleaded guilty to all charges in 1998 and got slapped with eight consecutive life terms in prison without parole. Unfortunately, reports came in around 2023 stating that John took his own life in prison. Charles Cullen 
Charles Edmund Cullen was an American serial killer who hid behind the very profession meant to save lives. Now, Cullen wasn't your typical killer. He was a nurse, someone you'd expect to be caring for the sick and vulnerable. But beneath that nurse's uniform lay a heart as cold as ice. Over a horrifying 16-year career, he roamed through several New Jersey medical centers, leaving a trail of death in his wake. The body count is staggering, folks. Cullen confessed to taking the lives of possibly 40 patients, though authorities have confirmed at least 29 of those murders. Can you even wrap your head around that? A nurse turned serial killer lurking in hospitals, preying on the very people he was supposed to help. But how did this gruesome tale come to light? Well, it all started on December 12, 2003, when Cullen was arrested at a restaurant. They hit him with one count of murder and one count of attempted murder, but that was just the tip of the iceberg. On December 14, during an interrogation with homicide detectives Dan Baldwin and Tim Braun, Cullen spilled the beans. He admitted to murdering Florian Gaul and trying to kill Jin Kyung Han, both of whom were patients at Somerset Medical Center. And here's the bone chilling part. He casually mentioned that he might have offed as many as 40 patients during his dark career. In April 2004, Cullen decided to plead guilty before Judge Paul W. Armstrong in a New Jersey court. He admitted to killing 13 patients and attempting to end the lives of two others using lethal injection. As part of a deal with prosecutors, Cullen promised to spill the beans and cooperate with the authorities. In return, they agreed not to seek the death penalty for his heinous crimes. A month later, he added more names to his list of victims by pleading guilty to the murder of three additional patients in New Jersey. As the legal proceedings took place, the questions loomed large. How could someone betray the very essence of their profession, the oath to do no harm? And as the court proceedings continued, it became increasingly clear that the answers to these questions were as unsettling as the crimes themselves. The guy had no remorse. He even taunted the judge during the proceedings, repeatedly chanting, Your Honor, you need to step down. It got so out of hand that they had to gag him with cloth and duct tape. It was like something out of a horror movie. Now, here's where it gets even more eerie. As part of his plea agreement, Cullen agreed to work with law enforcement officials to identify more victims. Can you imagine the sheer horror of uncovering even more lives he extinguished? Finally, on March 2, 2006, Cullen was hit with 11 consecutive life sentences by Judge Armstrong in New Jersey. That's right, folks, he's not eligible for parole until June 10, 2403, which would make him a whopping 443 years old. He's currently cooling his heels at New Jersey State Prison in Trenton. David Berkowitz Born on June 1, 1953, David Richard Berkowitz would become infamous as the son of Sam and the .44 caliber killer, earning a spot in the history of American serial killers. This sinister saga begins in the gritty streets of New York City on July 29, 1976. Berkowitz started with a reign of terror, setting off a chain of events that would haunt the city for years to come, but get to know this man before he became a household name. Berkowitz, a native New Yorker, had his share of life experiences. He even served in the United States Army, but something dark lurked beneath the surface. Armed with a .44 special caliber bulldog revolver, he embarked on a killing spree that claimed the lives of six innocent people and left seven others wounded by July 1977. New York City had never seen anything like it. The city that never sleeps was now sleepless with fear, and Berkowitz had the big apple in the grip of terror. What made it even more horrifying was Berkowitz's knack for taunting the police. He left behind letters that mocked law enforcement and promised more gruesome crimes. The press ate it up, and the world watched in horror as the hunt for the son of Sam unfolded. But finally, on August 10, 1977, Berkowitz's reign of terror came to a screeching halt. He was arrested and hit with eight counts related to the shootings. And here's the chilling part. He confessed to every single one of them. Initially, he spun a bizarre tale about a demon taking the form of a black dog owned by his neighbor, Sam, and claimed to have been following the demon's orders. However, after being deemed mentally fit for trial, Berkowitz changed his tune. He pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and was given six consecutive life sentences in state prison. He even admitted that the whole dog and devil story was nothing but a sinister hoax. It was as if he found joy in playing with people's minds. But that's not the end of this twisted tale. Berkowitz's infamy reached such heights that he became somewhat of a celebrity. The media couldn't get enough of him, and it seemed like he enjoyed the attention. To curb criminals from profiting off their crimes, the New York State Legislature enacted what we now know as the Son of Sam laws. These laws were designed to prevent criminals from cashing in on the notoriety they gained from their heinous acts. They still exist in New York and have been adopted in other states as well. Now, in the mid-1990s, Berkowitz had a new story to tell. Claiming to be a converted evangelical Christian, he amended his confession. This time, he alleged that he had been a member of a violent satanic cult that orchestrated the murders as ritual sacrifices. It was a shocking tale that sent investigators back to the drawing board. In 1996, a fresh investigation into the murders kicked off, but it hit a dead end with inconclusive findings. The truth behind Berkowitz's reign of terror remains a mystery. Michael Swango 
Michael Joseph Swango was an American serial killer with a disturbing medical twist. It all begins in Tacoma, Washington, where Swango was born. Raised in Quincy, Illinois, he was the middle child of Muriel and John Virgil Swango. His father, a Vietnam War veteran and an alcoholic, wasn't around much, leaving Swango closer to his mother. After high school, he enlisted in the Marine Corps, where he developed a thing for physical fitness. You'd often catch him jogging or doing calisthenics on the campus of Quincy University. Swango graduated summa cum laude and even earned the American Chemical Society Award. While at medical school at Southern Illinois University, Swango's behavior raised some eyebrows. Instead of focusing on his studies, he preferred working as an ambulance attendant. That's not the weird part. It's his fascination with dying patients that's truly disturbing. Many of the patients he attended to mysteriously coded, and five of them didn't make it. Creepy, right? As if that wasn't enough. Swango's laziness nearly got him expelled from SIU. He faked checkups during his OBGYN rotation, and his fellow students suspected it for years. However, a committee's split decision allowed him to graduate, but he was a year behind his classmates and had to repeat some rotations. Despite a terrible evaluation, he secured a surgical internship at Ohio State University Medical Center in 1983. Here's the real thriller. Patients started dying left and right under Swango's watch, and nurses noticed something peculiar. Whenever Swango prepared food or coffee, people got violently ill. One nurse even caught him injecting something into a patient who later fell seriously ill. The nurses reported their concerns, but they were met with accusations of paranoia and investigation. In 1984, cleared Swango, but OSU decided to pull its residency offer. They feared he'd sue if fired without cause, so they wanted him gone quietly. In 1985, he was arrested after arsenic and other poisons were found in his possession. This conviction led to investigations into OSU's handling of the case, revealing glaring shortcomings. But Swango was released in 1989 and worked as a counselor in Virginia. He was soon fired for making a scrapbook of disasters on company time. He then worked as a laboratory technician in Newport News, where employees mysteriously suffered stomach pains when he was around. Swango, now known as Daniel J. Adams, tried to re-enter the medical field with forged documents. He landed at Stony Brook University School of Medicine in New York, but didn't stay long. Patients started dying under his care again, and the AMA conducted a thorough background check. They discovered his past and promptly fired him. Swango managed to disappear for a while, but in 1994, the FBI found him in Atlanta. He was working as a chemist, but was fired once the FBI alerted the company about his fraudulent past. Swango then moved to Zambia and Namibia, but he was finally apprehended at Chicago O'Hare International Airport in 1997. He was arrested for fraud, and it was during his time in prison that authorities built a case against him for murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole. In his book Blind Eye, it's estimated that Swango might be connected to 35 suspicious deaths. The FBI believes the number could be as high as 60, making him one of the most prolific serial killers in American history. Joaquin El Chapo Guzman this is Joaquin Archivaldo Guzman Loera, or as he's more famously known, El Chapo. Born on April 4, 1957 in Sinaloa, Mexico, El Chapo came from humble beginnings. He grew up in a poor farming family, and life wasn't exactly a walk in the park for him. In fact, he endured quite a bit of physical abuse from his father, but little did anyone know this tough childhood would shape him into one of the most powerful drug lords the world has ever seen. El Chapo's journey into the drug trade began early. He teamed up with his father, not for a game of catch in the backyard, but to help grow marijuana for local dealers during his younger years. Yeah, that's not your typical family bonding activity. By the late 1970s, he was in cahoots with Hector Luis Palma Salazar, a rising star in the Mexican drug game. Chapo's role? Helping Salazar figure out the best routes to move drugs through Sinaloa and into the United States. He was like a GPS for illegal substances, but that was just the beginning. In the mid-1980s, he took on a new gig, working alongside Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, another big-shot drug lord. El Chapo was basically the logistics mastermind behind the scenes. In 1988, El Chapo founded his own cartel after a fellow drug lord's arrest. Under his leadership, the cartel became a major drug producer and distributor, operating globally, including in Europe. El Chapo also pioneered distribution cells and long-range smuggling tunnels, setting records for drug exports to the United States. And all this drug dealing didn't just bring him power, it made him obscenely rich. Forbes even ranked him as one of the most powerful people globally between 2009 and 2013. The Drug Enforcement Administration even claimed that he was right up there with the legendary Pablo Escobar in terms of influence and wealth. But here's where things get wild. El Chapo's criminal career is full of drama. He was first captured in 1993 in Guatemala and sentenced to 20 years in prison in Mexico. But guess what? He managed to escape in 2001 through some shady correctional officer bribing. You'd think that would be the end of the story, but oh no, it was just the beginning. His escape turned him into a fugitive and the authorities slapped an $8.8 .8 million bounty on his head, courtesy 
courtesy of Mexico and the US. And after all the cat and mouse games, he was arrested again in Mexico in 2014. But wait for it, this guy wasn't done escaping. In 2015, he made a cinematic exit through a tunnel that his buddies dug right into his jail cell. Seriously, someone should make a movie about this. Mexican authorities weren't going to let him slip away again. They recaptured him in a dramatic shootout in January 2016. Finally, he was extradited to the United States a year later. In 2019, El Chapo faced a slew of criminal charges related to his leadership of the Sinaloa cartel. He was found guilty, sentenced to life imprisonment, and now resides in ADX Florence, Colorado, one of the most secure prisons in the United States. Enjoyed the video? Crave more excitement? Stay tuned by clicking on any of the cards on your screen right now for more thrilling content. See you next time.